Samuel Sagarvasandani. My friends call me Sam. I am from Indonesia. I'm a second year at the University of Warwick, studying economics and industrial organization, and I'm the head of liaison here at WAC. I'm also your MC and moderator for today's event. Before we go any further, I'd like to lay down our house rules. Firstly, please make sure that your mic is on mute to ensure that there are no external distractions during the event. Secondly, we highly encourage you all to keep your camera on. This is to make sure that the session is as interactive as possible. Also, we love seeing your friendly faces. Now, please allow me to briefly explain what WAC is and what we're about. WAC is the UK's first and largest student-led ASEAN conference. Through our flagship conference and our pre-events, we aim to foster a strong network of pass a passionate ASEAN youth and provide a platform for inspiration, hope, and feedback towards building a forward-looking ASEAN community. We at WAC understand that the talent of today are the leaders of tomorrow, and we believe that discourse between the youth and current leaders will lead to a brighter future for the ASEAN region. Now that you know what WAC is about, please allow me to outline the flow of this event. We'll first have Nyan Yi, our chief coordinator, give her opening remarks. Afterwards, we'll have a discuss discussion with our esteemed guests. And lastly, we'll open the floor to a Q&A session. During the Q&A session, y'all can either ask questions through either unmuting your mic and asking directly, or can simply pop your questions into the chat. Either way works. Um, now I'd like to pass the mic to Nyan Yi to give her opening remarks. Dear speakers, colleagues, and participants, welcome to Warwick ASEAN Conference's first live episode of Coffee Insights. My name is Danny, and I am the Chief Coordinator of Warwick ASEAN Conference, otherwise known as WAC. On behalf of my team, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. Most notably, I would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed speakers, Mr. Chan Kok Long from IP88 and Mr. Wong Wai Ken from Stash Away, without whom we would not be gathered here today. Thank you, Mr. Chan and Mr. Wong, for taking time off your busy schedule to join us today and share your expertise surrounding the topic of today's episode of Coffee Insights, Digital Economy in ASEAN. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues, especially Beverly and Rizia from the speaker's team, for planning and organizing this event. Established during the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, the primary aim of WAC's Coffee Insights series has always been to provide a platform for delegates across the globe to learn about issues within the Southeast Asian region from professionals of various fields. Coffee Insights began as a podcast housed on WAC's YouTube channel, with four episodes released within the last year. This year, we have decided to rebrand Coffee Insights into a live online session, facilitating more productive discussions and more genuine connections between our delegates and speakers. Coffee Insights also serves as a lead up towards our main conference to be held next year on the 26th of February at the University of Warwick. Team Charting Our Future, our main conference will explore what lies in the future of ASEAN. How has the pandemic diverted our path? How can ASEAN as a region and economy bounce back from this crisis while creating conditions which allow the ASEAN member states to thrive in this post-pandemic world? What is the role we as youth and young change makers must play in order to rise up and become the leaders of tomorrow? The topic of today's episode of Coffee Insights, Digital Economy in ASEAN, is undoubtedly an important piece of the puzzle. Over the past year, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the shift towards digital. Digitalization of financial services changed from merely being a convenience to becoming an absolute necessity, as nationwide lockdowns made physical access to banks difficult. People also became more aware about the importance of saving for a rainy day, catapulting interest in investment. As a result, words such as e-commerce, robo-advisor, and cryptocurrency have been pushed into the spotlight. But what do they really mean? What does the digital economy entail, and what implications does it have on the Southeast Asian region? How does one get involved, and what is it like to be at the forefront of the digital economy movement? These are all questions we aim to answer in today's episode of Coffee Insights, as we hear from the experts themselves. My heartfelt thanks once again goes to Mr. Wong and Mr. Chan for joining us. And to all our participants, thank you for tuning into Coffee Insights. I hope our event will prove fruitful to you. Without further ado, I shall pass the floor back to Samuel. Thank you, Nyani. Before we proceed any further, I'd like to introduce our two esteemed guests and their organizations. Mr. John Kok Long is the co-founder and executive director of IP88. He holds a Bachelor of Science from University of Bangsan, Malaysia. IP88 is a Malaysian payment company that offers e-commerce, retail, online banking, e-wallets solutions, among other services to its clients. Currently, IP88 operates in seven Asian countries and is supported by over 100 financial institutions. Mr. Wang Wai Ken is the Malaysia Country Director of Stashaway, 
He holds a Bachelor of Commerce and Bachelor of Economics from the University of New South Wales. Stashway is a digital wealth management platform that provides clients with high quality, personalized wealth management services. Stashway is currently operating in five countries globally and is backed by some of the biggest financial institutions in the world. Without further ado, let us welcome our two esteemed speakers, Mr. Chan Kok Wang and Mr. Wang Wai Kat. Um, how are you both doing? Hi, everybody. Good. Thanks for having us. It's good to have both of you. So um, should we just jump straight into the questions? Yeah, let's do it. Um, so my first question will be directed to Mr. Chan. Um, could you briefly explain how payment gateways operate and what is the key in operating payment ga uh, gateways? Okay, um, payment gateway is no longer just an online payment now. Um, if you were to study the uh, evolution of payments, uh, payments already reached to a stage where we, we reach an omni-channel stage. Omni-channel stage uh, to layman uh, um, is if, as long as you see any digital gadget um, touch point with the consumer, all digital gadgets can turn into a payment acceptance uh, 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 point. Uh, I give you one example, like photoset machines. I think some of the universities in UK, uh, you whenever you want to make copy, you actually pay uh, the, the 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 fees that you need, and and and. Nothing stops the uh, small panel at the uh, uh, photo set machine that can accept a QR code, which is actually a payment uh, uh, method, uh, like accepting uh, e-wallets and so on and so forth. Um, any uh, information screen, uh, even a TV, uh, as long as it's a digital gadget, um, uh, even a TV, like, for example, you can turn a TV into a, a, a payment uh, touch point. And uh, that is very, very important. Um, uh, because of that, maybe I can even ask back to the audience, what are the impact uh, if, if any uh, digital touch point can turn into a digital payment uh, uh, gadget? What is the impact to the businesses? What is the impact to the industry? And what is the impact to the consumer? Now, if you can answer to all this, the impact, then you will start to uh, find what are the pain points in every industry, in every segment of the um, uh, market. Now, those pain points will actually give you the opportunity. Now, if you guys uh, are seriously, for example, looking into uh, identifying what are the uh, business opportunity, you should start looking at pain point and how consumer behavior changes uh, because of all this uh, pain point plus. Uh, 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 technology evolution, uh, how it changed the consumer behavior. Now that actually opened up a huge opportunity. I, I call it, personally, I name it uh, 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 this uh, opportunity as a digital void. Suddenly you see a big void vacuum uh, in, 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 the, uh, in, in the business space that whatever businesses that you have been seeing, whatever traditional business that has been doing very well, now any businesses that don't even uh, 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 put in effort to go through a digital transformation or moving into a digital presence or digital space, I can assure you all these businesses eventually will lose up in terms of their market leadership, in terms of their market share, profitability, margin, and so on and so forth. Now, so it's very important for businesses to move into the digital space. COVID-19 is not something that people say, oh, COVID-19 confirmed uh, 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 every company need to be in digital space. Not just to confirm, COVID-19 make it a mandatory, it's like compulsory for businesses to move into the digital space. Now that's very important, right? So if this happened, it become a mandatory means the adoption of digital, the adoption of payments, digital payment uh, is being shortened. And because the adoptions in terms of consumer behavior, adoption in terms of company towards the digital payment, then it actually create a lot of disruption. Uh, let me share with you, uh, not just because we are in digital payment, to me personally, I feel that digital payment is mother of all disruption, right? Now, why did I say so? You see a lot of technology, like for example, food delivery, all this, even WeChat and, and so on and so forth. It's nothing new. If you look back at our grandparents, what is food delivery? Now, the only difference I was doing our grandparents and now is 
when you make an order, you can make payment straight away. The moment you make payment straight away, commitment already uh, 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 committed from the um, consumer. And the moment the consumer committed the payment, then the restaurant or the service provider automatically is being bound to commit to deliver the services or the products. Now, all both consumer and the business's commitment is being um, uh, uh, established is because payment or made. If payment is not made, consumer got thousands of reasons if they cancel order or they didn't take the order, right? Even even uh, a very remote uh, excuse like, oh, I, I cannot take your order because I have to rush to hospital because my grandmother, 98 years old, just, just delivered a very healthy twins. No, no just, I, I hope you all get my joke. Right. So any reason can be, and any excuses can be a reason uh, to, to cancel the, uh, the orders. So now, because of this digital payment uh, and payment already reached to a stage, is, it is so matured. Um, the omni-channel um, uh, payment, uh, when I mentioned digital gadget turned into payment uh, touch point, that is where I say payment already reached a very matured state. The moment payment reached a very mature state, businesses have to evolve and change and capitalize on the digital payment. And companies and industry that capitalize on that will continue to grow even beyond their existing market uh, 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 market share as well as uh, existing borders because digital is always borderless. So um, I look at it as um, IPAD, we, we have seen um, payment is a mother of all disruption. So what we have been doing is we both with all industry, whether it's in property development, uh, whether in manufacturing, of course, retail and, and uh, uh, even insurance. And so literally all industry need to collect money. And because of that, we actually uh, create a very strong uh, leadership in the countries that we are present in, uh, especially in Malaysia. We have, uh, uh, I mean, the IPAD have, more than 50% market shares. And uh, today we, we, in Malaysia, we are transacting like a month, like uh, close to uh, 800 million USD uh, in terms of transaction volume. And we continue to see that um, the, 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 the smartphone will, will continue to play a major role uh, in escalating the um, uh, uh, digital adoption, as well as you will see more and more payment uh, will be available in future, the moment you want to buy anything, your supplier or your merchant, they got all ways and method to make you pay. And um, the, the next uh, trend or the current trend that is uh, trending very, very well is the pay buy now, pay later. To me, buy now, pay later is nothing new. It's literally uh, buying on credit, right? It's just that the technology allow uh, uh, buy now, pay later in every sector of the economy. Every sector, every industry you know, uh, can, can actually adopt buy now, pay later simply because of technology, right? So we are even looking at buy now, pay later to sponsor uh, students, all right? Uh, to pay your tuition fees, you, you pay now like you know, 10,000 ringgit or, or, or few thousand pounds, but you pay installment the next six months or next three months, so and so forth. So as you can see that <clears throat> digital payment is leading a lot of innovation, a lot of disruption, and this, in return, actually give a lot of benefits to the consumer. Obviously, at the end of the day, consumer uh, will definitely benefit from all this uh, digital disruption as well as innovation, right? Uh, I hope I give you some idea about the uh, trend and the digital payment. Unless you have a specific uh, question, feel free to just ask me, right? Sam, pass back to you. Yeah, that was actually very insightful, Mr. Chan. Um, hearing about how payment gateways and businesses interact as well, the operations of your company. It's really um, interesting to hear about. So I want to ask my next question to Mr. Ken. Um, so Mr. Ken, um, what exactly does StashAway do? How are your services different from traditional investment management firms? I saw online that StashAway uses the ERAA strategy. Mm -hmm. What exactly does the strategy entail and how is it different to um, competing firm strategies? Yeah, I think, um, um, good evening, good morning, everyone. It's really nice to be here alongside Mr. Uh, Mr. Chan. I think if you look at the fintech space, there's, there's just so many, uh, so many verticals and payments 
uh, underpins everything. You guys may not realize, but but the world and ledger banking system runs on very, very arcane, very, very old infrastructure. And if it wasn't for new payment systems and uh, new payment interfaces, it would be really, really difficult to, to live a modern life. You know, um, And I think if you contrast Mr. Chan's business, which is payments, and Stashaway, which is really into wealth, I would say payments is something that you need to do every day. Wealth is something that is a little bit more different, right? It's, it's something that uh, is aspirational because you definitely, if you have money, you will save. If you have more than enough savings, then you will choose to invest because you want to have a better tomorrow, whatever that means. And greed and fear has always been with us since the, since the beginning of time, right? And the line between gambling and investing is very thin sometimes. And um, everyone wants to be rich and everyone wants to be rich yesterday, but there's a, uh, there's very few predictable, legitimate ways to get rich quickly. So I think, in essence, what Stashway does is to help people grow their wealth in the long term. And of course, that concept is, is not old. There's, there's traditional unit trust companies, fund management companies have been around for, for a very long time. But I think what we do different is actually uh, three main ways. The first thing is to uh, make investing really, really inexpensive. Unit trust charge around 7% in terms of their fees, uh, whereas we charge only 0.8%. So you can see there's a 90% discount there already, right? So the main way we are able to do this is by not having agents. We do digital marketing. We have a purely digital presence with an app and all that. So we don't need to incentivize people to go out there and do any selling, you know? Um, that not just reduces the cost to, to you, but in the same vein also increases your returns because you, you don't have to pay that expense. So that's the first, first one. Second one is um, it makes it so convenient. If I told you guys, let's say 10 years ago, maybe you're in high school, that you will be able to pick your life partner by just swiping left or right. You know, like you would go, no, you're crazy, or maybe you're already doing it, I don't know, but you would say I'm crazy, right? But like, it's just to say nowadays uh, that everything is done from your phone, I think it's not, it's not a wow factor anymore. It's just a, it's a must have, you know? So having that convenience to just not fill any forms, just download an app, submit a few documents and to be able to invest straight away is, is huge. So we enable that. And the third thing is we have a very intelligent system to invest your money. There's a million ways to invest money. You can hope, you can pray, you can you can follow a style like Warren Buffett. You can uh, choose many different asset classes. But the important thing is how exactly uh, the the company that you have chose to manage your money invest for you. Which leads me into ERA, E R A A. I won't spend too long on this because it can be technical. But we have and we have a lot of material online as well. But just put it very simply, you guys are in the UK, right? Some of you. If it's if it's relatively warm outside, you go out with a, a t-shirt. But if it's really, really cold, you wear a jacket and a, and a, and a cap and a, you know, a long pants and all that. Mr. Chan's daughter is there already. So sometimes she may be warm, sometimes she may be cold, right? So she'll wear different things. So Ira also tries and have different assets in your portfolio for different times. In a recession, like we were in last year, you wouldn't have, you, you would prefer to have bonds and gold. In good times, like we are now, a bit with a bit of inflation, you would have some gold, some tech stocks, things like that. So we changed the composition of your asset class uh, of your portfolio, the asset classes within your portfolio to suit where we, wherever we are in the economic cycle. So a lot of people probably hearing go, going, okay, sounds good, blah, 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 some technical terms I don't understand, but what's the return? What do I get in return, right? Um, so our performance over the last uh, four years have been between uh, four and 17% per annum. If you take low risk one, around 4%, high risk, 17%. But that does come with volatility, right? It's not a free lunch, right? So uh, I'd say that um, a lot goes into that 17%, but um, we try and manage people's risk to ultimately, again, grow your wealth uh, for the long term. Oh, thank you, um, Ken. That was very insightful, and it's good to hear about like your investment strategy and how you guys are different from other firms. So I'd like to ask uh, my next question to Mr. Chan. Um, so there is a new buy now, pay later, pay for me, in which Malaysia hasn't introduced this. Do you know if other ASEAN countries are progressing in this field? And what are some challenges on this journey? Okay, the uh, buy now, pay later now is the one of the hottest uh, payment options. Um, um, buy now, pay later uh, started in Singapore, then quickly it went to Indonesia and then now Malaysia. Um, I think most of the ASEAN uh, uh, country, the, um, the prominent ASEAN countries like um, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, even Philippines, Thailand, um, 
buy now, pay later already uh, present in uh, most of all these countries. Uh, even the smaller countries like uh, Cambodia, um, players are start to uh, benefiting into uh, smaller countries. So the uh, buy now, pay later is actually nothing new. Um, past years, I'm sure whoever have credit cards, you got this uh, easy uh, installment plan. Uh, some might call it uh, as, as attractive as zero installment. That means zero interest installment plan. Meaning to say, if you use a credit card, if they, they actually uh, make full use of your credit limit. Let's say uh, if your credit limit is 3,000 ringgit <clears throat> and you buy something worth about 500 ringgit. So they actually block your 500 ringgit uh, limit where maximum now you can only spend the balance 2,005. Now this 500 ringgit, what they do is every month they charge on your uh, uh, like uh, expenses is like an auto debit and um, who actually absorb all these uh, 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 buy now pay later um, uh, fees or interest is actually the merchant now some merchant actually pay uh, it, it depends on their industry it depends on the uh, ticket size ticket size means the purchase uh, uh, the value all right and also it depends on the to certain extent risk so it can range as low as like um, Four to five percent to as high as uh, fifteen percent, right? Um, the the reference is always uh, this part of the world, especially Malaysia. There's a ceiling for this kind of uh, innovative uh, loan. Um, you you cannot go beyond the credit card uh, loan interest, which is uh, maximum eighteen percent per annum, right? So that is the cap uh, in terms of uh, the ceiling. Uh, how much interest? Um, uh, all these service provider can charge the, the merchant. Now, the interesting part of buy now, pay later, why now is because it actually goes beyond credit cards. Um, there are a few types of buy now, pay, pay later. The first type of buy now, pay later, as I mentioned, is actually uh, uh, utilizing your credit card limit. The second type of uh, buy now, uh, pay later is literally the service provider actually loan you money, right? If you, if you buy a 500 ringgit, they actually pay, they loan you 500, like, a, like a, the, the loan that the conventional traditional loan that you, you take. Um, and they actually pay the uh, merchant uh, uh, full amount. And later you have to repay, so to speak, the buy now pay later loan uh, on the, uh, a three month uh, loan uh, period or six months or depending on uh, the, the product as well as the ticket size. Now to, that uh, approach of buy now, pay later is actually very high risk uh, to the service provider, uh, simply because you are literally giving a consumer loan uh, with very minimum, in fact, no collateral at all. So it, it all matter of um, uh, trusting your data. Um, the data will say that, okay, the chances for this guy run away your, your, your 1,000 ringgit or 500 ringgit is very minimal, is within your, your risk uh, threshold, and then you can actually just approve the uh, transaction, right? So <clears throat> um, uh, this buy now, pay later, especially the last two, three years is, is really, really growing very fast simply because of uh, this pandemic makes a lot of people out of job and uh, uh, if any service provider or any company willing to, to, to loan you money to buy something, there's no reason why people don't buy on credits. So um, the, the growth is tremendous. Um, the, the, the first uh, big success of buy now, pay later actually uh, from Australia. Right, uh, uh, Australia, uh, they, 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 they launched this uh, buy now, pay later. In fact, before the pandemic, uh, before all this uh, lockdown or, or movement control orders like MCO and so on and so forth. So Australia, they are, they are, their company already uh, proven that buy now, pay later is a very good uh, business model. Now, from Australia to ASEAN, you, you must know the consumer behavior. ASEAN consumer behavior, I mean, um, uh, um, uh, most of the uh, ASEAN consumer, people like us, uh, we love to buy on credits. If people were to give us credit, why not? No, those kind of things. And moreover, during this pandemic, um, a lot of uh, consumer are being hit uh, by the uh, economy downturn, uh, downturn and so on and so forth. So this buy now, pay later is, is really growing very fast. Of course, uh, there are companies like Hula. I, I don't know whether you heard of Hula. 
Uh, these are the, the, the pioneer player in, in, in Southeast Asia, started from Singapore and, and, and uh, I think they are now uh, um, downsizing their operation. In fact, uh, they, are, they are actually uh, looking at uh, being acquired by somebody. Now, you see, being a pioneer, there's always uh, opportunity and there's always also uh, uh, disadvantages. Now, the advantage of being a pioneer is you, 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 you get the crop of the, the cream of the crop. But at the same time, because you are very new in this space, so a lot of learning curve and you make a lot of mistakes. So those who have deep pocket able to finance through such mistakes. Uh, if those who do not have a deep pocket, uh, that's where you find it very challenging uh, when you start to realize that the data is supposed to give you this kind of uh, risk profile. Uh, suddenly, the risk profile turned out to be something very risky, and 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 some company actually uh, lose a lot of money uh, in this uh, aspect as well. On the other hand, the loans, uh, the 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 transaction grow is 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 really uh, tremendous in Southeast Asia. Uh, as I mentioned, um, all countries in Southeast Asia, uh, especially consumer, um, they they will love to buy something on credit. Okay. So uh, that is a trend, and we we will continue to see that buy now pay later will continue to grow. More player, new players are coming in, and another very important milestone that uh, I'm expecting the central banks will start to look into regulating the buy now pay later, right? Now the danger of if you don't regulate this, a lot of people will end up buying a lot of things and, 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 and on loan no? uh, and on credit. It's like um, don't the the youth who who abuse the credit card end up you you see a, a lot of uh, Asian countries a lot of their youth uh, went bankrupt because of they can't uh, uh, service the credit card loan so the central bank had to step in right even do counseling uh, even help the 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 youth to you know uh, restructure their repayment and so on and so forth so um, uh, once the central bank step in then you will start to see that. Uh, more and more buy now, pay later are being regulated. Now, this is very important to the consumer as well as to the industry. The reason is very simple, right? To the consumer, at least now, um, the interest that they, they need to pay is being regulated. Uh, now, it's like the ceiling is 18. Everybody can charge 5%, 10%, uh, or 18%, and so on and so forth. So, but once it's regulated, then it will say, okay, this industry, the maximum buy now, pay later, uh, interest that you can charge is maybe 8%. So to the consumer, it is actually protecting the consumer as well. And when the thing regulated, of course, the risks are, are much uh, lower compared to now. It's like free for all. No? Everybody can come up with a certain uh, marketing campaign and, 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 and attract the consumer to use their buy now, pay, pay later. Now, the moment this company who being uh, uh, exposed to such a high risk or non, uh, we call it the NPL, uh, 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 this uh, non-payment uh, loan, uh, if, if this actually should up, then it actually have a very bad adverse impact to the company who provide uh, buy now, pay later. So um, if any of this buy now, pay later collapse, the impact to the economy is also uh, quite tremendous, right? So back to you, Sam, Sam uh, unless you guys got uh, more questions on buy now, pay later. I, I hope I answer your question. I think you definitely did, Mr. John. It's very interesting to hear about um, this new scheme and how it um, kind of relates to the consumer in the ASEAN region. But now I'd like to ask um, Ken a question, and it's um, kind of regarding COVID-19 and the future of your industry. Um, the pandemic has widened the gap of income inequality in the Southeast Asian region. Does this inequality gap have any implications towards Stashaway? If so, what are the steps that Stashaway is taking to um, kind of address this? Well, I, I think, you know, you're, you're uni students, right? And I think you will very soon enter a world and see things through very different eyes. And you will see that some of the idealism and things that you have been exposed to, maybe there will be a rude awakening. Right? If I can paint a realistic picture about, about uh, COVID and specifically how it impacts uh, uh, people's wealth, I think the old adage that the rich get richer is definitely true. Um, the truth of the matter is, is that there is no silver bullet to save those in the B40. 
the pressures will mount and they have very little safety net and government schemes will be there, but they will not help them all the way. They can help them maybe halfway. And sometimes government is just, just there to help you help yourself. For example, gives you access to your EPF and your PRS funds so that you can take it out and, and literally you know, buy groceries. So we're, we're, we're talking about this thing. And it's really interesting because we just heard a lot about the NPL, right? And those things, while are innovative, are, will not save you from poverty. So I think ultimately, there's no shortcut to wealth creation. And if you really want a better future for yourself, and I'm not talking about a policymaker, just talking as an individual, you really have to start planning today and planning for your tomorrow. Uh, many of you may not realize, but your first jobs may not pay as much as you think, especially if you come back from Malaysia. Uh, I can't speak for those in Singapore and Hong Kong and all that, but in Malaysia, if you get 5K a month as a fresh grad, very lucky already, you know? And um, if you really think about your own education, uh, sorry, your own retirement, that would probably cost uh, about 2 million, 3 million at very least to take home at least 10,000 a month, right? And then imagine you're 60 plus years old, you're not going to live on 5K a month. So in terms of wealth creation, I think COVID has definitely set B40 back a lot. Um, uh, the M M M40 and T20 have held very well. And uh, we are in a unique position to see this because uh, we don't just manage people's money, we manage people's money through a really tough time like last year where even though markets fell like 35%, we still managed to give a positive return. Uh, we saw the people that really needed to withdraw money for their own, own lives, uh, people who are maybe not so fortunate, but who people who are very wealthy, they can invest more in the downtime. So while everyone is buying news uh, uh, toilet paper, we had people saying, do you think, can I just invest 500? Can I just invest 500,000, by the way? Can I invest 1 million? They asked me, right? And of course, we have to accommodate. So there's a very, very stark difference. And the only real solution is to look after yourself. Right? Um, and Mr. Chan, as, a, as an entrepreneur, I don't think got a lot of government assistance. A lot of it is his own entrepreneurship and his own management team's strengths here. Yeah? So you have to really look after yourself. And if you are to come out of this learning something, COVID, is that financial resilience is really important. And that if you invest for something for the long term, you need to be in a really good place to continue investing during, even during tough times. And even especially during tough times, because that's actually where a lot of the opportunities lie. So maybe not such a rosy picture and all that, but, but that's, that's the, the truth, yeah? the God's honest truth. So yeah, happy to take Q&A from the, from the floor after this about other things as well. Okay, Sam, I want to add, add on something uh, uh, on what Ken has uh, mentioned. Um, uh, I, I look at it is uh, you you guys, uh, especially you, you, it's a matter of time, uh, you guys uh, come into the workforce. Now, if, if assuming if you come from a privileged uh, uh, family, uh, this is really an opportunity for you to really study, you know, uh, what kind of investment. Uh, because this COVID-19 actually created Big problem at, at the same time created a lot of opportunity. Um, uh, meaning to say, if you got money, you will make more money now, right? Of course, like what can say between gambling and investment is a very uh, thin line separating uh, these two. So you need to do research, study, and or maybe talk to people like Ken, know uh, uh, which area, uh, what is your favorite investments, and so and so forth. Now for the M M40 and all these things. This is a time for you not to spend luxury. Uh, whatever uh, money that you have uh, is the best time to put into uh, investment. There are, there are plenty of good investment now. Um, and for those who, who, who come from family, which is B40, uh, to me, don't be despair. You know, um, when I started IPAD, I actually started with minus 300,000. You know? I actually loan, I, I, I actually uh, uh, owe the banks few hundred thousand because me being naive in the stock market, no, like like what Ken said, the time I think I'm more like gambler rather than investor in the stock market. So uh, the 1997 financial crisis actually made me lose a lot of money, and end up I I actually owe the bank uh, uh, about 300,000, uh, like 30 years ago. Huh? Uh, uh, so it's is 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 300,000 is quite big. Huh? All right. So what you need to do is, if you are not from all this privileged uh, family, my suggestion to you is never be despair. Look at industry. 
go into the industry, work for the industry that you know that this industry is going to give you good returns. All right. My message is you must learn. Uh, go and learn yourself. You don't have money to invest, but go and learn yourself. Be more in the industry. Right? If you think uh, certain uh, banking industry that give you good uh, future in terms of uh, investment, go to the, maybe join the digital banking. You don't see which are the un underserved or the unserved uh, 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 banking market that uh, uh, this digital bank is, is, is targeting. So from there, you can open up your mindset uh, as well as giving you another uh, view of opportunity through your lens, you know, those kind of things. So um, uh, always remember, every crisis, there is danger and opportunity. So whether you look at the danger or you look at the opportunity. Okay, back to you, Sam. Yeah, so um, thank you both for answering the questions and adding on. That was very insightful. Um, now we want to move on to the open Q&A. And let me just um, give a quick side note. We want to answer as many questions as possible. So if you could keep the answers brief, that would be great. Um, but um, if any of you want to ask a question, please feel free to use the raise hand function and unmute your mic. Um, or alternatively, you can post your questions in the chat box. Either way is good. Um, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand. There's a question okay. saying that, uh, what are the interesting fields that you see in upcoming in ASEAN? To me, you must move into uh, tech base. Um, the ESG is very um, uh, important, uh, environment, uh, all this govern, uh, governance, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, in the investment uh, community, um, uh, this ESG is being placed as uh, uh, one of the important uh, points to take note. Uh, uh, any company that want to invest, if, 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 if they um, uh, practice ESG well, so this company actually uh, can stand up. Right, um, tech-based uh, company definitely is is key uh, to the next uh, 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 economic growth. Uh, of course, um, uh, I will say that um, whatever majoring you guys has, if you can do um, uh, uh, um, some study on philosophy, I always believe um, philosophers are actually creator. Right, go and get get a book for on philosophy. You know, uh, try to. Um, uh, uh, see from the lens of a dreamer. A philosopher are all dreamer. But on the other hand, dreamer are also creator, right? So um, maybe to prep yourself is getting a book on philosophy and start to, to, to read. For example, in this, uh, after this COVID-19, if, if those who are in final years, we are not talking about looking uh, outside the box anymore. We are talking about looking an opportunity, a problem with a new box. It's not out of the box, it's a new box. So a new box means you, you have to really, really uh, being very innovative in terms of your thinking. Your mindset uh, shift is very, very important. It's no longer one plus one equal to four or five. It's like one plus one equal to thousand, those kind of things, right? Now with technology, it, things can happen. Uh, the, the synergy and so on and so forth, right? Uh, back to you, Sam. Yes, um, thank you for the answer. I think uh, Ruje, um, raise your hand. So please feel free to ask your question. Um, hello, um, speakers. Yes, uh, I have questions and thank you so much for your answers. I've been enjoying the sessions. Um, my question is directed to uh, Mr. Ken. So like, um, I understand that, yeah, like Stash Away has recently expanded into the Thai market and stuff. And I'm very keen to know the difference between, you know, like having uh, expanding and, <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Like, uh, <laughs> um, basically, what's the difference between setting up like an like the investment um, company probably uh, in the ASEAN region and comparing to like a more developed financial hub like Hong Kong, Dubai, London, or like, you know, what, what's the challenge being in the ASEAN region? Thank you. Yeah, uh, you know, we are a Singapore HU company and then we expanded to Malaysia in 2018. And then a year ago, uh, let's say early 2020, we launched Dubai and then since then has been uh, Hong Kong and then Thailand. Uh, Thailand. So just for for your context, we started talking to the Thai regulators uh, before we even started starting to talk about talk to Dubai and Hong Kong. But Dubai and Hong Kong launched before Thai Thai country uh, launched uh, recently two months ago. So the whole process took almost two years to talk to the Thai regulators. And generally, as a startup looking at different markets, we look at two factors. 
the regulatory environment and uh, the wealth market. So Hong Kong, Singapore, Dubai are quite international financial centers. And Thailand and Malaysia are fast growing uh, countries with uh, good demographics which will pay dividends later. You, know, you can say the, the middle segment is growing very quickly. The wealth market here is growing very quickly. Uh, and underlying all these countries, there's inefficiency. Wealth management products are extremely generic and very expensive. So that's why there's an opportunity here for, for, for us. And the main thing I'll say about international financial centers and, and then markets like Thailand and Malaysia is that um, there are no capital controls in these countries for the right reasons. You know, Mr. Chan men, men, men mentioned 97 and, at the, and the Asian financial crisis involved our currencies being devalued a lot. And for that reason, you can't just open up your, your, your country's flows. Uh, so ultimately, we see a lot of uh, restrictions. And our main goal is to help uh, Malaysians and, and our clients worldwide to invest globally. So we have to comply and ultimately help them, help them grow their money. Now. But I'll say just to sum up, uh, development, de developed countries regulators are much more efficient. The, the Hong Kong uh, SEC took two months. It's laughable, you know, like two months, you know, Malaysia was like 11 months. Uh, Thailand was like almost two years. So of course, it's not just two months in terms of like from start to end, but we started talking to them a little bit earlier, but once you file, it's two months. So they treat you like clients, you know, like, you know, it's a very uh, business friendly place. But of course, it's a very competitive space as well. So in terms of, uh, you know, if you're an entrepreneur putting your chess pieces on the board, the market is big, but it's also very competitive. And Malaysia and Thailand maybe the sweet spot because the market is decently sized, but not as competitive. So you have to hedge your bets, you have to be smart, you have to take a few risks. But in the end, that's where we are. And the markets in itself represent about four to five trillion US dollars in value. And then if we can if we can scrape the dust off of the top of the iceberg, then we'll be doing very well already. Okay, uh, I want to pick up uh, Marcus' question. Uh, um, is the data science industry, uh, uh, data science, uh, I think data science uh, or data analytics is is uh, key to a lot of uh, uh, companies' uh, uh, strength uh, as well as opportunity. Uh, I think your university, Warwick, uh, Warwick has a, a very good master program uh, on data science. That's why I, I, when my daughter choose to uh, study uh, the uh, data science uh, or data analytic course, uh, so I say, by all means, go. The reason is very simple. Every tech company is worth billions of dollars. Their, their valuation is not just because the company make millions of uh, whatever profit. It is the data that has they've been accumulating. And at the end of the day, those data is actually a huge gold mine because uh, <clears throat> with such data, company can provide A to Z with uh, anything that a particular consumer wants. That data can actually uh, give company the upper hand on uh, what are the things to sell to you? What are the services to offer you? And it's literally how to make money from you. So maybe you can think of getting your master's uh, after your first degree, right? Any other yeah. question? <clears throat> um, yeah, so I see one really interesting one in the chat from Wilfred Ang. Um, the uprising of central banking digital currency in Cambodia, uh, Malaysia and Singapore piloting it in November, 2021 and Vietnam and the research uh, progress it. How do you think that we will be integrated into payment system gateway within ASEAN? Okay, this um, digital currency, uh, uh, don't um, uh, mix up between a digital currency and a new currency like Bitcoin and so on and so forth. Digital currency is literally your own currency, but in digital form. Uh, it can be your ringgit, it can be your sing dollar, rupiah, but it's in digital form. It's no longer printed on a, on a physical paper and so on and so forth. Um, uh, that's why a lot of people are trying to uh, confuse the market, saying that, oh, uh, uh, central bank in China actually recognize uh, um, a new currency. You know, uh, uh, it is actually uh, uh, a digital currency where it's in digital form. The RMB is in digital form. Now, as as far as um, uh, uh, regulating this uh, digital currency, uh, central bank is uh, is working very hard to come out. Uh, with um, with the standards and, and also how to regulate uh, such 
the digital currency. Now, once the currency is in digital form, it makes the currency so invincible, right? Um, uh, but um, if you are talking about integrating all digital currency into one platform, and um, the, the currency that can actually travel from one border to another, um, the cross border in terms of uh, digital uh, payment is uh, uh, still a very uh, challenging uh, aspect uh, because the central bank is uh, working closely how to regulate this. Uh, the movement of the digital currency is, is very important. Um, uh, it won't be, it won't take the central bank years to come out with policy and guideline. I think uh, uh, give them another, well, the next 12 to maximum 24 months, I think you will start to see a lot of uh, uh, regulator will, uh, will introduce a lot of uh, uh, regulation on making uh, currency from one country to another is uh, being seamless. Uh, things are happening, uh, like uh, what Belfred mentioned about uh, Bakong, all this. Uh, this is basically the switches. Like Malaysia, we've got the FTX uh, switches, right? Uh, in Thailand, you've got the prompt pay. You know, uh, in, in Singapore, is uh, pay now, those kind of things. Uh, so Malaysia is doing now. All these, all these switches uh, will, will make uh, cross-border uh, uh, currency uh, is, is a successor uh, and also reality. So it's a matter of how to integrating all these switches and also the, how to uh, look into the forex exchange and so on and so forth. So you, you, as long as they, they, they can address all those issues, then you will see that currency is no longer being limited by borders. Uh, meaning to say, if you got money in bring it in your whatever account, whether it's in wallet account or in your bank account, that money can be used seamlessly. Eh? When you reach Thailand, you don't even need to change into Thai baht. So the moment you 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 pay uh, using your bring it uh, account and you buy something in, in Thai baht, the system uh, will do all the uh, uh, exchange, the forex exchange, and and the settlement and so on and so forth. It's all done within the ecosystem, right? Hope that answered the question. Any other question? Um, yeah, so thanks for the answer. Um, I think we have one really interesting question in the chat from Gareth. Uh, while we all acknowledge that embracing digitalization is the way forward, some of us have concerns about our data security, especially when our finances are involved. Example, payments, investments. Given that huge responsibility of ensuring data security often falls on firms, do you foresee a time when code breaking technology will eventually surpass encryption uh, protection technology? What would the future look like? Um, I think this would be directed for both of you. Um, so yeah, if any one of you want to answer first, do go ahead. Ken, you want to answer or I, I can put in my thoughts. Um, not just only um, uh, all this uh, in, encryption and so and so forth. Um, uh, when more people are embracing into technology, especially all our cloud-based, uh, cybersecurity becomes something very, very important. and. And, and the cost of uh, protecting data is, is no longer cheap. Uh, let me tell you, like, for example, payment gateway like us, uh, the amount of money we, we invested in uh, data security, cyber security, uh, to, to, to protect all this data is, is very, very expensive. And, um, and we see that uh, the cost will continue to escalate. Um, uh, as far as uh, encryption and, and code breaker, all these, um, I look at it as uh, new technology will come in. Hopefully, the blockchains were were able to answer some of the concern and 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 so on. And and we are looking forward to any uh, new technology uh, in in that aspect, right? I Can you want think, to add uh, on? Yeah, sure. I don't think actually that that um anything is truly secure at any one point in time. It's just the cost of being involved in the in, an online presence, right? I think you have to think about two things which are quite separate. Um, how safe is your money and how safe is your data? I think data is something that is more accessible. I think if you guys paid attention on Lao Yet, uh, you know, uh, JK, JKM's uh, database was also leaked and it was going for a few million bucks and there was like 4 million people's information there. So it's not a matter of, of, of if but when. Uh, money on the other hand is very different, right? Money uh, being stolen, so to speak, is, is, is very, it's very, very difficult to do so because of uh, the structure that's, that's actually been set up by the banking system. Like if let's say something leaks and uh, my information is out there and how much money I have, okay, fine, that's a data leak. But in terms of actually uh, hacks accessing actual money, that is, that is a whole different thing. I think it's a 
but it's actually impossible. Lah. But it's an it's an ongoing arms race, and it's something that like Mr. Chan said will continue to to be more and more expensive. So if you think about that, and let's say you work in cybersecurity or you work in uh, info security, right, infosec, you can also make invest. You have you can form an investment view that that backs this up, right? If you are curious and you notice trends, you can also act on it by investing in future trends, right? We talked about so many things here today, and if there's a particular trend that you want to make a bet on the future, there's there's ETFs out there that uh, encapsulate um, uh, information security and, and cybersecurity rather. So there is a huge space. More is being spent in this space than, than ever before. More ransomware and all that are being uh, propagated. So it's a space that will only be more and more valuable. So on one hand, you can be worried and you know wring your you know wring wring your, your hands and all that, but on the other hand, you can just uh, actually invest in an ETF that encapsulates that thing, which will definitely do quite well in the, the future. So yeah, just be curious if you see any of these trends. Think about whether you can invest in them, what's the best way to access them, and you'll be you'll be surprised, you know. Uh, another small note is that all of you will have different and very different and you know varying and interesting careers. And let's say some of you work in oil and gas, you can you will know more about the oil price than me, right? So you will have your own view, you have a really solid view and an investment hypothesis, you can actually take charge and, and profit from it. So there are many trades to be had. So so yeah. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, I'm sure our delegates have um, some more interesting questions to ask. Is there any platform that they can contact you to kind of get in touch and ask these questions? Yeah, uh, LinkedIn's a really good place. I dropped it in the, in the chat. If you don't have LinkedIn, I think you should. As a young person who's, who, who, who wants to get hired, LinkedIn is a really good place to do that. Um, some of you already added me, which is, which is very nice. Um, it's a really good place to, to build a presence. I, I see a lot of uh, young people do it these days and a resume will only go so far. So get LinkedIn and start now. That's a, that's a really good place to, to reach me. If you have uh, thoughtful questions, I will respond with a thoughtful answer. But if you just add me because you want to sell me something, then I, I, won't, I won't respond. Um, uh, me and too. Uh, LinkedIn is the, the best platform. Um, and of course, uh, to all the final year students or even uh, you guys, if you guys want to come back to KL, Internship is, IPAD is always uh, taking a lot of uh, internship. Um, we also hire, um, uh, we, we never stop hiring in all departments. Um, whoever have data science uh, uh, knowledge uh, or data analytic knowledge will be really added advantage. Uh, those uh, programmers, IT base, um, uh, definitely you guys can easily get a job. Uh, like for example, IPAD, on on monthly basis, uh, uh, tech, tech talent, we are hiring more than 20, 30 staff every month. So we are really growing that space. Uh, uh, um, data analytics is an uh, area that almost all departments want uh, data analytics now because uh, uh, technology gives us a lot of um, the data and we want to really uh, see what is the the, the things that we can benefit from the data. So uh, data science uh, is a, another good area. Uh, cyber security definitely is a new thing. Uh, uh, as I said, if those want to go into entrepreneurship, be a dreamer, start to pick up a philosophy books to, to see uh, the problems that we are facing now through the lens of a dreamer, right? So, well, Sam, back to you. I think LinkedIn is the best uh, platform. Uh, uh, reach us through LinkedIn. You can Google my name and uh, I paid it. Uh, then you, you will get my LinkedIn uh, contact. Um, okay. Yeah. So I think that um, marks the end of our session. Um, I thank both of you very much for the insights and um, the information that you have given us through your, um, your talks. Um, we hope that our first episode of Coffee Insights for the new academic year has been hopeful and inspiring. We'd like to thank our speakers again, uh, Mr. Chan and Ken, for taking time off your busy schedules to join us on a Saturday evening. Um, additionally, a huge thanks extended to all our delegates for your wonderful participation. We appreciate all of you joining uh, despite the time zone difference. Um, further, we value your feedback and would love to hear from you regarding our conference. Please check your inboxes 
and um, fill out the feedback form so we can keep improving this event as well as all future events.